បាទសូមស្វាគមន៍មកកាន់កម្មវិធីជួបជាមួយ <cười> អឺពុទ្ធគ្រួសារឬក៏ពីគ្រួសារដែលមកដល់ហើយត្រូវគេប្រជុំត្រាប់ទៅវិញហើយគាត់បានសរសេរជាសភាពហើយដើម្បីយ
um, violent time in U.S. inner cities and how a lot of the refugees ended up being resettled in, in more inner city communities. And the government maybe wasn't prepared as best they could at the time to help integrate them, to give them the resources, to help with um, rehabilitation for for what people have gone through genocide and then just to resettle and expect everything will be fine. The, the trauma was still there. And then in some cases, these families were subjected to further trauma from the neighborhoods where they were resettled um, and lack of understanding sometimes with um, language understanding, cultural understanding. So I think it was this kind of the fuller picture of everything that happened, beginning with that genocide, but continuing in the U.S. and kind of the failure of the resettlement process in some ways. Yeah, I think the the settlement to the United States in the beginning, it was a, a, a big, a huge step for the Cambodian refugee because there's a language barrier and also the struggle to survive. So because when you're coming from the refugee camp, basically you have nothing. So everybody just probably just have to, basically the parent probably just, have, well, I, I don't think it probably, they just have to work. And when they work, they spend a lot of their time working. They don't have much time studying. And then the kid, they don't have much time to to uh, take care. I guess that's probably the best, uh, the, it's a combination of everything that causing them not to have a, a good, you know, good education for themselves that can pass on to their kids, right? Yeah, I think so. That, that definitely happens. And then the parents, like you said, they're working all the time and it's not, they don't understand the culture or the language and they're kind of isolated. And then the kids are in these schools where they're sometimes getting teased and picked on. And so sometimes then they form together for kind of self-defense and end up getting in some trouble. Um, and the big thing then too is when the, when those kids then grow up and later maybe face deportation. What struck me too was with um, under the Khmer Rouge, families were separated. And then if you have this where you separate with the deportation, separate the families again, you're just continuing this legacy of trauma and separation. And I thought that was what was so um, devastating about. Uh, for the community is to to continue the family separations. And I know some of the older generation, the survivors who faced with their children being deported, even though their children are adults now, the idea that they'd be separated once again kind of brought them back, brought back those memories of the Khmer Rougiers and so re-traumatized them in a way. Yeah, so what I do is I try and follow basically four families, although I interview some other people. and think at least two or three of those families are from Long Beach. So, um, and I talk about, I have the different generations there, the oldest generation who maybe is in their seventies now, who, who were uh, young adults or in the prime of their life under the genocide, the, that middle generation who is more actually my age range where they're um, in the middle of their lives right now. And they, most of them, um, born in Cambodia or born in a refugee camp, but came to the U.S. as very young children. And then there's the third generation, which is in many cases, they have children of their own. Um, so some of the families I've, I've followed, uh, one, one young man, he has, at the time, his son was, I think, four when I started following him. I think the son is now maybe eight or something. But so um, if he was deported, then that son would be left without a father, just as actually he had lost his father to the Khmer Rouge. So you'd kind of have that continuation. Um, and while I was following, I followed the families for a year and I looked at families facing deportation and all those members. And then I also made a couple trips to Cambodia where I talked with people who had already been deported and talked to the Cambodian government about um, that and kind of looked at what life was like for those who have um, been forced to go back to Cambodia. Yeah, um, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation. Thank you, Katya. We come with you some of the clips and back. So, so I couldn't drop away back. I'm going to make him go from that to get such a boy. Then I necessarily spoke to me. We go back my dear. I'm going to move to the United States. What California? How I try to. Rod Kelly for the Napitude, the Lapas of Kumari, 
you said you have followed four families. Is your book contain about the four families in the book? Yeah, so I try and tell, I think the best way to tell a story, I have a journalism background, is, is through people, individual stories. And so I try and tell this larger story through just several really more intimate stories um, and really track those families. But their stories are similar to what um, many others in the community are experiencing. And then I'll, I include um, some contacts about the laws and the legislation that impacted the community and then what happened before. Uh, but yeah, I do focus on one family is Sam Croucher. She is, she's the one she's in, I think she was in her mid seventies when I met her and then her adult daughter, Sati, who actually has children of her own and Sati was facing deportation. And so I tell the story from that family, from the mother, from the daughter, from the granddaughter, from some of the aunts and kind of um, try and give a fuller picture for that family. And then another family I mentioned about the, the man who was a father who was um, uh, facing deportation and he had the young son. And so that was David and Solomon actually. And they're also Long Beach. And then I get David's mother a little bit more. That is just David and his son's story. And then I had another um family that was more a little further south and a few other kind of peripheral characters and things but those were kind of some of the main stories i focused on for those families so if they if they're going to deport those families then the if they're going to deport the mother and the father then the children are going to stay behind without anybody taking care of other than the grandparent, is that right? Yeah, and it's a hard choice. Like David was thinking maybe he'd take Solomon with him if he was deported because his son is so close to him and he's the main support for his son. And um, his mom said he thinks his son would be better with him, but then at the same time, then his son's married up here so far and then to take him to a country a foreign country and start over especially when David goes there he won't have a job he won't have he has to start from scratch so it's a really difficult um, choice to make but a lot of times what happens is the children are left behind here and then they they can't see that parent that often because it's very ex I'm sure your honey is good. Well, it's very expensive to fly to Cambodia and it's a very long flight. Um, and so it's not like you can go regularly uh, to visit that parent. Um, and the parent, once they're deported, although there have been a few cases now where people have been able to come back, it's very rare. And usually once you're deported, it's for life and you aren't able to come back even to visit or see your family or kids. So yeah, you're um, taking away a parent and, um, it's a huge loss to the community. So not just the, the deportation um, affects a lot more than that individual. It affects their child, the rest of their family, and then it affects the community too, because then the community's um, losing these members who could help raise children and there's this absence there. So I think that was the other thing with the book I wanted people to understand. People sometimes just see one part and they don't realize the ripple effects of something i think you're absolutely right it's a ripple effect because uh they uh, once they you see this is something that i don't understand about the the our government they spend a lot of money trying to have the couple not separated they have married counseling they're trying to spend a lot of money trying to counsel the couple so that they can marry together and raise kids together as a family. But on the other hand, they split up the parents and the child and the family. So it's kind of like, a, why do you, one side you want to keep the family together and the other side you try to split the family together here? I mean, there's a lot of options where, uh, I mean, there's a crime, there's a certain type of crime that, you know, when you, when you do a crime, you commit, uh, you got to go do your time in jail for a certain period of time and then you come out you'd be like normal why did you have to put them like thousands of miles apart that would affect plus the kid behind the kids that that are 
right now that's going to be raised by maybe a single parent or could be a grandfather or grandmother that does not speak English. And then you kind of like create another bad crop in here. Like you just said, it's a ripple effect. So it's from father to kids and then to kid again. So that, those are something that I don't really understand. You know, you spend money on one side, you save the couple together, and then on the other side, you try to split it, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's these short-sighted. I think a lot of times the government thinks of short-sighted solutions. They think, oh, well, this person wasn't a citizen and they committed a crime, so we'll deport them, get rid of the problem. But they don't realize there's a whole community of people here. There's a bigger picture there, and an individual impacts more than just themselves. And so I think, again, it's it's very short-sighted um, policies when when you look at these kind of things and don't look at how how that plays out long term and, and also what happens to those who are deported over there so in and, and like you mentioned all these people did serve time for their crimes so they did um break the law and then they they served their time um and were punished for that and so a lot of people see it as a double punishment that they then are subject to deportation and especially coming as refugees many thought they were legal permanent residents they thought it was permanent. They didn't realize that there was that extra step for citizenship and that they could face um, deportation because immigration law in this country is so confusing and complicated. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, don't understand and then the laws change and things. So it's, it's a really difficult situation. Yeah, I think, I think you're right um, because the, the complexity of the law and some people that, uh, like for example, the first generation of the Cambodian refugee that come here, they have no idea that they have to be a U.S. citizen. They don't know that. And when they have the kid that born here, or they bring their baby when they settle here, they did not realize that the baby that they brought in is not a citizen, and they have to be a citizen. They did not realize that. So at 30 years, 40 years gone by, all of this has happened. But the thing is that they, like you just said, they don't look at the bigger picture, which is once you take the breadwinner out of the equation, then you create more problem, more bad crop behind here. Because initially, the reason why I guess believe that the kid is committing crime because they don't have a lot of good education from the parent because the parent, when they come in, they have a language barrier, they don't have any money, they don't have anything, it's, it's just a refugee. So they had to work, I, I'm, I, I know a lot of the people work extra hour, they don't work eight hours a day, they always work like 10 hours, 12 hours, so they don't have time, they don't have a lot of time spent with their children. Therefore, some of them, like you said earlier, because they've been teased on, because they've been picked on at school, then they form a group of gang and that's what caused the problem. And we had, I think we had one, uh, we had one lady we interviewed, I think several years ago, I don't remember if, if they deported her back or not. She also told us about the same story because of their parent was working so hard, no time taking care of them. So she formed a group of, of the Cambodian gang, which is to protect from the other gang to hit them. So they form a group to help their own group, you know? So that it, it, you are right because if, if they do something like this, it's going to cost more and more. And if the person only have one child, that's only one problem. But if the person has three, three, four child, that's even worse because the child is now is going to go on welfare, right? It's you said that they some of them can come back. Is there any way they can come back, resettle back here? There was. There've been last I checked, there were two, but maybe it's three now. It's really difficult, but there are some organizations that are helping. And what happens is they have to then get their crime pardoned and then um, go through. There's been some um, pardons of people here that has helped them then um, not be deported. And but then there are some who were already deported who've been able to go back. And I think it was, I get it confused with all the legality, but I think they 
they go back and they get a pardon and then they're able to come back. But basically it's a complicated and lengthy process and not everyone qualifies for it. And you really need someone, an organization um, that can devote a lot of time and energy and effort to it uh, and has people who know the law well. So they can only take on limited cases they can do this for, but there have been, I think last I saw, I remember I've seen at least two, there was one person went back to Sacramento or maybe two, by now they're probably three or so, but so it's not that many. And one person went back, I think after five years of being in Cambodia. So it's, uh, they had children and then their children are practically grown, you know, by the time they get back. But yes, it is, there There are a few rare cases. Um, for the majority though, it it, it isn't um, anything that's gonna happen anytime soon because of, uh, the amount of paperwork expense and because some won't qualify for that. Oh, I see. So once you're gone, you're gone, basically. It's it's very small, small chances of coming back. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take another quick break and when we come back, we're going to continue again. Thank you. Become with you, some of that we and that. But so, so I'm to look at that. I'm going to make you a couple of uh, Ketia Sengel, she's the one who uh, said that she was a part of the group that was part of the group of California and she was a part of the group 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 of from the killing field of Cambodia to California and back but she was a part of the group of the group of Amazon or the group of the group um, Katia, you have spent four, you have spent four years, uh, writing this book, right? It was the, the inspiration started, it was kind of on and off cause I, I do other things while I'm writing. So it was several years, but it, it started probably the first thing started from the first article I wrote to when the book came, yeah, it was probably about four years, but some of that time is editing and other things. What happened is I'd gone, I was in Cambodia um, doing some reporting and I did a story about, I'd heard about the Cambodian Americans who'd been deported to Cambodia. And I'd heard a lot of stories, but I hadn't um, read any about women at the time. And this may have been back 2000, oh, it was a while back now, 13, 14, somewhere in there, maybe even 2012. And um, so I went in search of, of women because I knew some Cambodian American women had been deported. And a, as a woman myself, I knew, obviously it would be different for women deportees versus men. And there are a lot less of them than there are men, but I was interested to um, learn about that. And I met, one of the women I met was from was from Long Beach and she had a teenage son in Long Beach and and she was and her uh, mother was in Long Beach and, and the rest of her family and she was just very well spoken very um, open uh, very interesting woman and I it was through her I really realized there's a much bigger story here I can't really do justice to it and just a 2000 word article I, I need to because I can't I can only tell her part but I can't get into her son or her mother and so that's when I decided I wanted to extend it into a book but um, it, it took a while to figure out who would be willing to tell their story for the book she wasn't comfortable having her son and mother um, that, that it's a big invasion of privacy. It, it's it's something not everyone um, wants to do. And so I, I didn't end up being able to write the book about her. And so I had to find other people who were willing to, to share and trust me. And I was um, very honored that people had trusted me with telling their stories because I'm an outsider. I'm not from the community, um, but I felt as an outsider, I could um, help bring some of these stories to light uh, and offer a different version. Then I think it's really good when you have stories from within the community and then you have some from outsiders as well. I think it it helps um, the more voices drawing attention to something that is not getting coverage, I think the better. Yeah, I think, you know what, if, if you don't put it into the book or if you don't write a book, then not many people are going to know 
of how difficult it is for a mother separating from the child here behind. Most of them are under the age of 18, right? Uh, or under the age of 10, even some of them, right? Yeah, some like the one man I followed, David, when we started, his son was like four or something. And, and David wow. had, reported then. So, but yeah, they would be growing up. They're, they're young kids and they'd be losing that parent very young in their lives. Um, it, and the chance that they really wouldn't see him. Like the one that I was, uh, I wrote the article about, she, her son was a little older, but in all those years, she didn't get to see him. Finally, I think her siblings saved up some money and were able to bring her son to visit her. But it was really difficult for her because she was still trying to treat him like a little boy, but he'd gotten older. And so he was fighting against that because she hadn't been there in those years when he'd grown up, really. So it, it's really, I don't know if there's a better word for it than just tragic, um, the, the destruction of these families. And, and, and when you destroy the families, then, then you're helping destroy the community. Yeah, I think it, it's heartbroken because you kind of like split the family apart, especially uh, a mother and and the young kid. Uh, that's that's normal. Any young kid, they 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 want to be close to their parents as much as many times as possible. And when you take them out, I'm, I I don't even, I cannot even imagine when the mothers leave. I don't know how many days that the kid cry nonstop for for that. You know, um, how. Let's say people want to buy your book. Where do they find the book? <clears throat> yeah, actually, you could find it um, Amazon or Barnes and Nobles or any bookstore can order it. It's by um, a pretty big publisher. My publisher is University of Nebraska Press. So if you just put my name and exiled uh, online, you'll find a lot of ways you can buy it. Um, and I think if you can, local bookstores are a great support. At, and they can order it if they don't already have it. But also, Amazon's usually the cheapest and easiest. <laughs> <laughs> I guess does does the book have? Uh, do you have it in digital? Like I mean, audio books or, or only on paper right now? It's it's a it's a Kindle, and actually, the Long Beach Library, um, the Mark Twain branch has a copy. I gave them a, donated them a copy, so they have a copy too at the library, mm -hmm. and um there is there's it's a kindle version i don't think it's on audio yet i have to check on that oh okay that's good because some people you know uh drive a lot or you know don't spend time like me i i, I like to listen <laughs> because i don't like to sit there and stay at the book i like to listen because that way when i drive i go somewhere i can hear you know and when i listen i can do it again and again and again so that I can remember exactly what it is. And it's also sometimes it's easier because um, when you listen, you can actually do some other things, you know, and then you can go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a really good point. I actually just had asked the publisher about um, what we can do, because my first book is, you have on audio, but this one isn't yet. So I, I, I'm working on it. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's coming soon. It's coming soon anyway, right? Um, the uh, the uh, the family that are split up that you are fo that you follow those the kid most of those are all under age of eight uh, under age of ten or are they any one of older now? It, it varies. Um, it, some of the ones I um, so I follow the main families, but then in Cambodia the people who've already been deported um, I, I follow up with some of them, and some of them have older children. Some of their children were younger when they were deported because it's been going on for quite some time, these deportations. And uh, Siti, one of the women I was following who was facing deportation, her children were actually grown. Um, and she was at the point she had grandchildren. And it was interesting with her, her children still though, she didn't get to raise her children because she had, um, she'd basically been in a lot of abusive relationships. She had been a teenager under the Khmer Rouge and she said she got used to being beaten and so she'd get in these relationships and she didn't really know anything else um and so she ended up being abused and her children her mom ended up raising her children and she'd reconnected now as an adult uh as an older adult with her grown, some of her grown children and they were saying losing her now once they finally had this chance to reconnect with her 
would be hard on them and also their children, her grandchildren. Um, she's able to have this relationship with them she didn't have with her kids and they would be um, devastated to lose her. And it was also interesting, her mom, the woman who's in her 70s, the idea that her daughter could be taken from her, that was so hard on her. Because we, we think obviously the, the people who are deported and then the children they leave behind, that is very sad. But we forget the parents, even though it's an adult child that's being deported because they lost their family, the family separation under the Khmer Rouge, it brings that back. It brings back all the pain of that separation before. And it actually, some of those elderly parents who are, are possibly facing the, the loss of that adult child that I found um, some of the saddest uh, as well because of what they'd already gone through. And then to go through this again so late in life uh, was devastating. Yeah, you know, um, I, I just don't understand either. You know, there's a there's a policy that bring the family together, and then there's another policy to split the family apart. <laughs> it's it's really it's I, I don't understand how that's going to balance out. You know what I mean? We're going to take another quick break, and when we come back, we're going to continue with the conversation. Become a tea some some with pets and but but some sa kom trap away ba. Um, you know, I. I see that American policy, I, I saw, I think it's a, a year or two years ago where you can see the family that run over the borders and they put it in the cage. And some of them, uh, the, the kids that are here and the mother have to be deported and they're on the fence, over the fence and they kind of like, it is really, really sad and the kid is crying and, uh, you know, splitting up a family is one policy of, <laughs> <laughs> of our government here and then the other policy okay if you have your family uh, back in a different country okay we'll bring them in to so that you can live together you know so i i just don't understand that part especially uh the way the refugee come from as you said you know we come from a very a, a very basically horrible regime that never ever happened anywhere other than probably the Nazi, you know, what is it, Hitler? Those are probably the worst, worse than our, I, I would think. But I, I've been in, in the proper regime. And I know how difficult it is. And when you come from that place to a country where you don't speak a, a single word English and you're able to go to work, you're able to make some money, raise the kid, they get educated. But sometimes, not a lot of them, right? I think that's, that's, that's some of them, they're pretty good. They become doctor, they become dentist, they become pharmacy, they become engineer. There's a lot of them that, that grown up and get very well educated and work in a, you know, government or private sector that help, the, uh, that help our government and help the country and help everything. But there's a very few, very small one who are, and that is, I'm pretty sure that's happened to every, every race, every um, ethnic, you know, it doesn't have to be just Cambodian. Another thing that I heard of is, is the Vietnamese, they don't deport the Vietnamese. Do you have any idea about those? And is it fair that they deport one and not the other? So that, that was an interesting one is that um, Vietnam, there's this memorandum of understanding that Cambodia signed with the US and then Vietnam has one with the US and Vietnam had just a little more power with the US than Cambodia did when they signed it. And they, um, on that say, they won't accept uh, deportees that came before in 1991, I believe it was, but um, Trump has not honored that recently and has deported um, some uh, people from Vietnam who did come after that. So before, yeah, uh, the Vietnamese community was a little more protected than the Cambodian one because um, I think it was just government, the Vietnamese government had a little more power in negotiating. It it's all comes down to politics um, when they negotiated that and they were able to do that, but Cambodia wasn't able to negotiate the same thing. And there was talk about trying to get Cambodia to, to renegotiate. And, and they, they tried, but the problem is 
the U.S. is so powerful, then I think when Cambodia tried to do something, then the U.S. says, okay, well, we just won't give visas to Cambodians coming to the U.S., you know, and then what can Cambodia do? So it's it's really hard for um, the Cambodian government to do something different there. The U.S. puts a lot of pressure on them. So with the Vietnamese community, they had that different agreement. But like I said, Trump ha has not... Um, it's agreement of understanding and, and Trump has not honored it more recently. And there have been um, some from the Vietnamese community who came after, who did come as refugees um, and, and were deported. I haven't followed as recently on that, but I know that did come up and people were really upset about that because it went against that memorandum of understanding that they had and protected some members of that, that community. Yeah, if they were born here, so if they're they're citizens, they can't. Um, this the the laws they put these laws in effect in the nineties, and it, it's particularly aimed at these um, uh, legal permanent residents. So they have different um, legislation, different consequences for felonies, different de definitions than you would for a citizen. So once you're a citizen, you can't be deported. So if they were born here, they're safe, or if they have gotten citizenship. It's okay, but if you're just a legal permanent resident, your um, these laws can impact you, and you can be. But it, those the laws that went into effect on that, it was like it was after the Oklahoma City bombing that there were two different laws that made it possible to deport legal permanent residents um, for felonies. But um, they're felonies under immigration law, but under um, Regular law, they're not necessarily felonies. So they're things people have been deported for shoplifting, joyriding, a lot of drug charges. And then, of course, some more um, uh, there's murder and those types. But you also get the writing bad checks, the shoplifting, the joyriding and these kind of things. Um, and, and the problem is once you have a, a record, then you can't apply for citizenship. So it's this this kind of vicious circle on those kind of things, too. And then the the different penalties for the legal permanent resident versus citizen, and then of course, not everyone understands immigration law. So when you go to court um, and you're a legal permanent resident, you're supposed to be informed of um, the immigration po uh, penalties you might face for this. But a lot of times, uh, the people, the lawyer you're working with, something might not know those penalties, and so some people aren't informed. Other people aren't given. Um, you're supposed to also have translation, but sometimes I've been at a court hearing where um, uh, they asked the woman if she wanted a Kamai translator, and she did, but they didn't have one that day. And so they're like, well, can we do it anyway? And she said, okay, but she would have done much better with a Kamai translator. She spoke some English, but her understanding when it came to complicated legal things was not as good um, in English. So there are all these reasons um, for confusion and why some of these uh, things happen. And I guess, like you said, the trying to keep families together and then we split them. We, we kind of brought these people to the U.S. as refugees. We welcomed them. But then when things don't go perfect or something, we just kind of shut them out. And I guess also when we're talking Vietnam, Cambodia, we forget a U.S. involvement in those countries in the first place that helped um, contributed to the rise of Pol Pot and that regime, um, all the extensive bombing um, of Cambodia and, and those types of things. So I think we really need to look at that bigger full picture because so much times it's, this is just looked at as is in isolation without that context. Um, we almost run out of time right now. Uh, I, I would like to give you like a minute or so, uh, your final thoughts or so what you think about the books and how basically that to promote your books and where we can go and buy and all of that stuff, so please do. Oh, thank you. Well, I think I want to um, first thank the Kamai community for actually, in writing this book, I couldn't have written this book without the community, without people being willing to, like I said, trust me with their stories, open up to me, and, and let me tell those stories. Um, and, and the community is very warm and welcoming and um the relationships there I've been able to make are just really special to me. Um, and so I, I thank everyone who, who did help me with that. And um, I think 
Yeah, the book, again, why I wrote it is why I do journalism, why I do stories in general is because they're things I think are important for people to understand. And, and stories I want, I feel, need to be told and you need to, um, I want people to know what's going on so so they're informed about this. Um, and you can um, buy it. It's exiled from the killing fields of Cambodia to California and back. And you can buy it on Amazon. Um, you can buy it Barnes and Noble. You can, if you just um, go to your local bookstore, when we can go to those again, I think some are opening up again now. You can ask them to order it if they don't have it because it's pretty widely distributed. So it shouldn't be too hard um, to get, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Petya. Much. Your name it sounds like a movie in the studio when I first hear your name. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to interview you today. And um, well, next time we'll talk to you again. And uh, to the children the Timetry, a man came ដល់ពេលក្រោយមកទេអាមេរិកគេត្រូវបញ្ជូនត្រឡប់ត្រូវសុខខ្មែរវិញដល់ហើយទៅគាត់ក៏បានតាមដានចំពោះមនុស្ស